Hi there, good morning, Sarepta Church. It's Alexander Fenter. Um, I'm grateful to Alan Blackman and the leadership for inviting me to do some talks and share with you on prayer. The sense that Alan and the leadership has from God is to call the church to pray um, for the first season of this year. And obviously amidst the corona pandemic and all the amazing uh, and different and stressful challenges we have in life today, uh, perhaps there is nothing more important <laughs> than the call to pray and to equip God's people to pray. In fact, literally to disciple followers of Jesus in His school of prayer so that we really have a vital personal, healthy relationship with God through prayer that helps us to overcome all that is going on in our lives and in the world around us. So I truly am honored to speak on prayer this morning and over the next few weeks to you guys. And uh, I just want to again honor the presence of our King and say, Lord Jesus, what a joy, what an honor to be with you here online with all my brothers and sisters and everyone in range of my voice who will watch this video. Jesus, we all honor your kingship. We honor the fact that you are head of this church that is listening to this, this, this video um, message. Jesus, you bought this church with your precious blood. You died and rose again to redeem us and enfold us into, into the Trinity, into Trinitarian community. And so we receive your gift of your Holy Spirit, Lord Jesus, to teach us and instruct us. Holy Spirit, open our minds, open our hearts and school us in the prayer of Jesus, the prayers of Jesus, the one whom we follow and we worship. And Father, we honor you and thank you for the gift of your Son and the gift of your Holy Spirit. Father, pour out your love into our hearts by your Holy Spirit as I share the word of life. So help me as I speak, Lord, what comes from you. Let it penetrate and bear much fruit. What is not of you in what I say, let it fall to the ground and die. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we honor you and we worship you and we receive you in this moment as I break the word of life with my brothers and my sisters. In the name of Jesus, I pray this. So, folk, prayer and the call to prayer. I'd like to call this little mini series that I'm doing with you um, Lord, <laughs> teach us to pray. And that, of course, is this amazing uh, request of Jesus's first followers from Luke chapter 11. And I'm going to be w working from Luke 11 today. So if you have your Bibles and you want to read with me, I'm going to read and refer to the text, obviously. But um, in Luke 11 uh, verse 1, it says, One day Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he had finished, one of his disciples, and Luke doesn't say who, but one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John the baptizer taught his disciples to pray. So this I've taken as the theme of, of four talks to expound, I would say, the learning school of Jesus, learning with Jesus how to pray. Um, and it really is around this request, Lord, teach us to pray. And it came out of this remarkable little cameo that Luke gives where Jesus went, Jesus' common practice, and we will see when I discuss this in the future talks, Jesus' common practice was to withdraw on a regular basis for prayer, solitude, silence, direct engagement with God. And that, of course, was the source of his, his life, let alone his leadership and his ministry of the kingdom. 
So he was praying in a certain place at a certain time. And obviously the implication from this text is that, that at least this disciple, if not others, were watching him. And perhaps from a distance. And they were so uh, gripped and moved by Jesus' uh, um, encounter with God in prayer. He wasn't just saying prayers. Something was happening there that just gripped their attention. And as they saw him praying, when he had finished, they just said, Jesus, that's amazing. Obviously, prayer and conversation with God as your father, with God your father, is so real to you. Please teach us to pray basically like you pray. And so, you know, at one level, prayer is easy. Even the smallest little child can kneel next to his or her bed and talk to Jesus and pray. At, at, yet at another level, prayer is not easy. The more you pray, the more you realize that actually prayer is a battle. Prayer is a challenge uh, to spend extended time in prayer. Where do we find the words? How do we spend time with God? So at one level, we really need coaching teaching, training, to help us to become prayers, to pray our living and to live our praying, to pray all that happens in our life daily through the day, and then to become a living, breathing prayer to God by learning to pray as not only acts of prayer alone, which is very important, I'm going to emphasize but also the spirit of prayer that grows within us, that we, that we become the people of the presence, as Jesus was the person of the presence. The presence of the Father was so in and through Jesus to all those around him because of his most profound, intimate connection with the Father in prayer. So likewise, we as followers of Jesus are called to be people of the presence. And the key for that is prayer. The, 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 the motivation, the purpose of that is not only for our enjoyment of God and relationship with God and intimacy and growth in God, but it's also for us to be God's instrument and means of His presence to all those around of us, all those around us, that we actually are the communicators and the carriers and the imparters of the presence. And prayer is the key to that. So Alan is completely correct by calling the church to a season to intensify prayer, to learn to pray, to engage in prayer, to pursue prayer and grow in our capacity to truly know God and to be intimate with God. So this, I'm going to be working from this text. Lord, teach us to pray just as John taught his disciples to pray. Because we observe in you, Jesus, that when you pray, it is so personal. It is so real. You don't just mouth words. You're not going through a religious ritual. There is something profoundly real that happens when we observe you praying. Oh, man, teach us to pray like you pray, Jesus. And that is my heart's cry. I want to pray and learn with Jesus, not only from Jesus, but I learn with Jesus because he's praying now. Paul says, and the book of Hebrews says, Romans 8, Paul says, Hebrews says in chapter 7, verse 25, Jesus lives at the right hand of the Father in his resurrection body, praying for us continually. So Jesus right now is praying. He's talking to the Father on our behalf. And we learn with Him, from Him, how to pray as He prayed when He was on earth for 30 years. And in His resurrection body, eternally, forever, at the Father's right hand. So what a joy, what a privilege to be with Jesus and learn how to pray and become intimate with the Father by the Holy Spirit, just as Jesus was. And therefore, God's instrument, the Father's instrument of His presence, His love and His power in the world around us, 
Let's pray, dear friends. So before I continue with this and introduce more specifically this issue of prayer, I want to emphasize a text from Paul. So because prayer is obviously very personal with between the Lord and and, 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 and the individual. So it is individual prayer, but it is very um, deeply and profoundly community prayer as well. So when Paul writes to Timothy, so Paul is actually writing from prison, uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, in Roman, he's writing to Timothy, who was leading, he was the lead pastor at the church in Ephesus, the church that they planted. And he had left younger Timothy there to pastor the church. And his instructions to Timothy as a young pastor in terms of how to lead the church. Chapter 2, so chapter 1, he's just introducing his love for Timothy and his prayers for Timothy and his encouragement to Timothy. And re-emphasizing Timothy's call to ministry and to leadership and to, and to shepherd God's people. But then in chapter 2 verse 1, he says, I urge therefore... First of all, that praise and requests and intercessions and thanksgiving be made for everyone. And then he gets specific. And for kings and leaders, church leaders, civil leaders, business leaders, national leaders. And for all those in authority so that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness and then of course he, he he goes on what is actually quite interesting between you and me guys i'm not talking to the woman now just the guys <laughs> paul paul says in one, 1 timothy in the whole context of prayer he comes down to verse 8 and he says and i want men and here literally in the greek is i want the men the males everywhere to lift up holy hands and pray without anger or disputing. And what is interesting to me, two things. First of all, the highest priority in the church at Ephesus that Paul is instructing Timothy to teach the church and build the church around is prayer. First of all, Timothy, in that church, and I would believe in all the churches that Paul planted, the highest priority is teach and live and model and implement and coach and train the people to pray. First of all, pray. Prayer is intercessions. Prayer is petitions. Prayer is requests. Prayer is thanksgiving. They obviously are, prayer is multidimensional, multifaceted in its engagement with God, with very... Uh, different aspects to prayer and we'll come to some of those but the first and important point here is for Paul in his mind the highest priority in the local church is prayer and it's corporate prayer as well as individual prayer let the church pray and secondly he says I want the men to pray now notoriously you and I know <laughs> from our local church experience that often when it comes to the prayer meeting and to pray it's the woman who pray and it's it's well known in church history that revivals have been preceded often in fact most commonly by women who just give themselves to prayer and intercession both day and night it's like anna in the temple when jesus was born she prayed both day and night for the coming of mashiach to save Israel and to bring the kingdom. And she prayed 24-7, day and night in the temple. And one day she saw the Messiah, the answer to her prayers. But here Paul is saying, men, I want you to pray. I want you to give yourselves to pray with holy hands and without unresolved anger, unresolved disputing, unresolved competition and stuff. Because prayer cleanses the heart. And effective prayer comes from a clean heart of engagement with God. And of course, if you look at chapter 3 of Timothy, the second priority is leadership. If you look at chapter 4 of Timothy, the third priority in the local church is spiritual formation. If you look at chapter 5 in Timothy, 
<laughs> the fourth priority is all the network of relationships. And so I'm not doing an exposition on Timothy. I better stop there. But I did want to emphasize, friends, that the highest priority in Paul's mind in the local church is prayer. And I don't have time in these four talks to talk about Paul and prayer. I'm focusing on learning with Jesus how to pray. And, uh, but Paul was a man of deep prayer. He gave himself like his Lord and Master, Yeshua Hanotsri, Jesus the Nazarene. He gave himself to regular, daily, and ongoing prayer, which equally was the source, not only of his, his ministry, his leadership as church planting, but was the source of his life, just like it, prayer was the source of Jesus' life. So, friends, coming back to Luke chapter 11 and learning with Jesus in the school of prayer. So I want to just define prayer simply by saying prayer is relationship with God. And I mean, even more, more simpler, prayer is talking to God. It is communication with God. The word communication is actually quite interesting. Communication means communion. And communion means, it comes from the word common, the th a common life, a shared life, the things that you have in common. You commune about and you communicate. It's mutual communication. But beyond common is, is community. It builds community, communion, which ultimately is union. It's this profound, intimate oneness with God. So that is what prayer is, communication with God, and it's dialogue, it's conversation, it's not monologue, it's not one-way relationship. But there are two essential dimensions in this relationship. Prayer is communion, as I've described, this community, this intimacy. Prayer is for God's sake, to know God, love God, get, become truly intimate, to build up your relationship with God. So, Obviously, the closest illustration to our spiritual relationship with, our, with God on earth, the closest illustration, is marriage. In the covenant of marriage, husband and wife build relationship and commune and learn to love each other. And the key is communication, which leads to communion and union. And it's the same with God. We pray for God's sake. <laughs> we pray to enjoy God. We pray to just be with God. And the other dimension is collaboration. So it's communion and collaboration. And collaboration essentially is that the more we pray, we enter into the mind and the heart of God. And we begin to pray for God's interests and God's concerns. And, we bring, and, and that becomes a collaboration in the fulfillment of God's kingdom purposes on earth. Because there's spiritual powers that oppose the work of God. And prayer is the greatest force in to collaborate with God in the advancement of His kingdom. So, friends, communion and collaboration. In fact, a story comes to mind. Let me just tell you briefly this little story. That I, as a teenager, I became a follower of Jesus on the, on, on, on the, on the 7th of June, 1968. And, and I was 13 years old, and at about 14, I was given an article from a Catholic magazine that told the story of a nun who every day knelt next to her bed and practiced five, ten minutes of silence just waiting, waiting on the Lord. And she opened by saying, Jesus, I am here not to ask you for anything, but just to be with you and to learn how to love you. And then she would be silent for 10 minutes. After a couple of months, she extended it to 15 minutes. After months and months of discipline, she extended it to 20 minutes. Eventually to half an hour. And after a few years of experience, she had a, most, a wonderful mystical experience one day. She was kneeling with her hands on the bed, just waiting in utter silence, adoring and holding Jesus in the womb of worship. This most intimate communion that goes way beyond words, even pictures and imagination. It's this direct, 
unmediated spirit to spirit union with God. And then she felt someone gently opening the door and coming into her room. But because she, she, she was aware of that, but, but, but because she was praying, she didn't stop to turn around to see which sister was interrupting, which other nun was interrupting her prayer time. She just hoped that the person would get the message and then go out the room again because she would see that she's praying, she's waiting on God. So she just remained in the posture of prayer, focusing on Jesus. But then that, that presence, that person, actually came up. She was aware that came into the room. And then she just, but she persisted not to be distracted. And then she felt this person come right up behind her. But she kept her eyes closed, waiting on Jesus. And then she just felt little drops like water coming on her hair. And she just refused to be distracted. And the water ran down and came and a drop came into her mouth and she tasted it. And it was salty. And suddenly she realized Jesus had come into the room. And Jesus was standing, bending over her and just weeping. And she heard his whisper, I have just come to be with you. And I'm grateful. I'm grateful for your presence. I'm grateful for your love and your companionship. I love you. And Jesus was weeping gently in gratitude over her. You know, I read that when I was 14 years old. And that's I, I tried to source in later years the origin of that article. was unable to, to verify it. But uh, that story made such an impression on me in my early discipleship to Jesus that it created a real hunger just to be with Jesus in prayer, uh, just to love him and learn to be with him. But of course, out of intimacy with Jesus and this prayerful communion and union grows and, and comes collaboration where we engage in the warfare of the kingdom by talking with God about what's in his heart and praying his concerns into being that his kingdom comes and his will is done on earth as it is in heaven. So let me just, let me just finish this talk because my time is now up or almost up with one last comment on this text. And then my next talk, I'm going to get into this text and talk from Luke chapter 11. But the context is important. So what is interesting is Luke chapter 11 is preceded by Luke chapter 10, verse 38 to 42. And it's the story of Mary and Martha. So whenever you interpret a text, you look at the context. So the story of Mary and Martha is quite simple. Martha's busy trying to serve Jesus because the rabbis come for lunch. And Mary just chooses to sit at his feet gaze into his eyes and talk to him. And she's waiting on him at his feet, listening, learning in prayer, dialogue. Prayer is communion and dialogue. And then when Martha's upset and says, Jesus, don't you want to tell my sister Mary to come and help me get the lunch ready? Jesus says this remarkable thing. He said, you're worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. And Mary's chosen that better part is to sit at my feet. You know, friends, only one thing is needed, and that is to truly learn how to pray, to be in the presence of Jesus. So that then opens up into Jesus then goes and prays, and Jesus is sitting at the Father's feet, and Jesus is listening to his words, and, and his disciples are observing, and they say, Oi, vey, Rabbi, teach us to pray like you pray. And the other end of the context is that after this whole passage on prayer, which ends in verse 13 of Luke 11, it says, And Jesus then was driving out a mute demon. And then it goes into deliverance from demons. In other words, what Luke is teaching, Mary and Martha, the, 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 the image or symbol of Mary is intimate communion and prayer. And then he teaches on prayer from Luke 11, 1 to 13, which I'll get into. And then he ends up the, the prayer context in that 
deliverance of demons. The kingdom of darkness is driven out, and it's a mute demon. In other words, that person was mute. And Hebrew prayer is, is most commonly lip prayer. The word of God's on our lips. We pray verbally. And this man whom Jesus delivered from a mute demon was unable to speak. But now, after his deliverance, he was able to speak. And to praise God verbally and to pray verbally, which is classic Hebrew prayer. So, Lord Jesus, I pray your blessing upon everyone who's heard this teaching. And I pray again by your Holy Spirit, Jesus, teach us to pray. Instruct our hearts how to be intimate with the Father in the Son by the Holy Spirit which we call prayer. In Jesus' name, amen.